Well, before we uh, get too far and everything, I want to say thank you to everybody that's here. And um, I think we'll have some more people coming in uh, for tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. And uh, appreciate everybody that has traveled a great distance uh, to be here. And uh, we look forward now uh, to this time of year. It's a lot of work. And uh, the devil tries to resist us a lot. Uh, but he always seems to lose. You ever notice that? Yes. Biggest loser in the world is Satan. He loses. And you know what's, you know what's funny? That what I just said to you, the exact opposite of what I just said to you was said by Kenneth Copeland several years ago. He said that God told him that the biggest loser in the Bible was God. Because God had lost uh, mankind, he had lost the planet Earth, and he really had no authority nor control over it, except when people release him by, by their quote-unquote faith magic, and that that's the only time God can do something in this world is when someone through the magic power of faith releases God to do something in this world. And he said that God, is, I mean, he said it. God is the biggest loser in the Bible because he lost everything. And Copeland and all the people like him, they believe that all of that power and control and authority is in our hands we are the ones who will shape the destiny of this planet. We will shape the, the future outcome of uh, the church, Christianity, how this world is, uh, the, the human body, uh, physical health, wealth, all of those things. He says that those things are in our power and we just have but to release those things. And I'm, every, every time I hear these guys, I'm going, that's witchcraft, that's witchcraft, that's witchcraft, that's witchcraft, that's witchcraft. That's witchcraft. And I can say that because I've read that book on witchcraft and witchcraft and witchcraft and witchcraft. And I've read all of those books and I recognize what they're saying and what they're doing. And uh, I, you've, a lot of you know my testimony, but just very briefly, uh, I grew up uh, in this church. Believe it or not, I know the secret passage to get under this stage here. And at one time I was little enough and limber enough to get under there. Uh, but that goes back to 1974, and uh, we've been part of this church uh, practically ever since, uh, me and our family, and um, it's a joy to be here. I don't want to be anywhere else in the world. Uh, I've been offered, uh, been offered various jobs and positions in other churches and other ministries and just very kindly turned them down, and um, because this is home and uh, this is where I want to be, and I'm glad that you get to be part of that with us. I really am. Um, so anyway, but there was a time, uh, and I'm, I'm destined to fill this church with more grandchildren. Just begging for it. But anyway, uh, at one time in my life, I was very, very hungry for things of God, and that led me to... Uh, number one, I guess switch. I, de I don't know that I ever really switched Bibles um, because the church really was uh, more conservative than I was at the time. And I, I knew I wouldn't get away with it. I tried it one time in Sunday school and somebody complained, so I didn't do it anymore. Um, but anyway, in my mind, there were a lot of questions and there were a lot of empty spaces that uh, I needed God to fill. I went uh, to an Assembly of God church in this area. They were having a revival, and I went uh, to the revival service. And, and I will say it was a good sermon. It really was. Uh, and, but I went forward at the end. Now, uh, in, you know, in our church, I guess a lot of Baptist churches and so on, uh, when you come forward, uh, somebody maybe will come and pray with you while you're at the bench here. Uh, and that's generally how it's done. I wasn't used to what they were doing. I, so I go forward and I'm basically, there's no bench to bow at and you have to stand. And, um, so I'm standing there and I, and I had already prayed, God, I want what you have 
unless it's not real. And God, I don't, I don't want to fall for a lie. I don't want to believe in a lie. I want the truth. And so I'm here. I'm not trying to tempt you in any way, but I'm searching. And um, so while I'm standing there, I can hear these people around me, mostly women, that were, and I'm going to say in most cases, pretending to speak in an unknown tongue. They were, they were, they were doing it under a pretense. They were just making gibberish tones with their mouth. And the Holy Ghost settled it fairly quickly for me. As I'm standing there, he's rolling me through 1 Corinthians 14. He said, Mike, you know that's not how it is. You know that's not true. So I agreed with God. Imagine that. I agreed with God. And then a man came by and he's going to lay hands on me. And there's somebody behind me. He's going to catch me. And so they came and laid hands on my forehead and nothing happened. I didn't feel no electricity, thank God. Uh, this was before I was electrocuted, so. But I didn't feel no electricity. I didn't feel like dizzy-headed or light-headed. Or, I didn't feel anything. And so when I didn't fall on cue like the others did, they came back down the line to try me again on the forehead and Johnny Bench sitting back there going to catch me and it, I didn't fall again and I walked out of that church that night and I said God you heard what I prayed and I want to thank you for that it is obvious to me now having gone through this that this is not true this is not real but God, I still want the truth. I want to know what's right. I want to know what's wrong. And I want to know it for me first. Because I knew at the time I was wrong in a lot of ways. And so God had patience with me and God had mercy on me. And I did promise him that I would never, I would never uh, do that again. And I never have. I've had offers from people. Uh, to lay hands on me and impart some sort of mystical magic power and I turned it down I said, no I, I don't believe so I don't and one particular situation I was in this ministry heads office and uh, as he's trying to sell to me what he offers and that is he can lay hands on me and impart dreams and visions and and I'll speak in tongues and I will be drunk in the spirit and all these things I have never experienced this before, but I'm not kidding you. There were angels standing like a brick wall between me and this guy. And I'm like, I could sense it. And I even brought it up to the guy. I said, there is a brick wall between me and you in this little office right here, right now. And he said, I'm sensing that too. I said, well, that's good. I'm not crossing. I'm not about to try to cross the wall. God is obviously building this. And so I'm, I'm just going to bow out. And that was pretty much about the last thing I ever had to do with him. Anyway, that is at least part of my testimony. Uh, my wife and uh, her family, I think they started coming here in 1980. And uh, we, um, so we met here. And uh, my sister facilitated a date between me and Sweetie Pie, Lisa. And uh, so we saw each other a couple times during Christmas break. And then we wrote letters back and forth during my third year of, of Bible college. And uh, we just decided, hey, well, let's just get married. Okay, we got married. 1987, 37 years later, still married. We still love each other. We still reach for each other's hands every now and then just to hold hands and honey, I love you, honey, I love you. And uh, we're enjoying that right now. We're probably just and I love enjoying the company of the people that love me. Say amen to that. Amen. There's nothing like it in the world to know that you're loved by people and that you love people regardless of who they are, where they are, what situation in life they're in. There's nothing better than that. Now. 
Having said all that, I want you to turn in your Bible. I mean, you know me, I'm going to put most things on the screen. But I do want you to open your Bible to these places. Um, they are significant. And um, this, is, this is a part of what I was going to do all weekend. And that is, I was going to uh, sort of, I guess, do an expose of fake spirituality, fake Christianity, uh, fake gifts of the Spirit, fake and phony um, charlatans like palm readers and mind readers and people who are psychics and can contact the dead and they bring the dead forward and the dead always seem to know something about that person that they're talking to and so on and so on. And I will say that there is a vast, vast proportion of people in this world right now who claim to be psychics, claim to be clairvoyants of some kind, or claim some of the one of those gifts, or claim those magic powers that are doing nothing but faking their way through it. And I was going to do this thing called the fakers. And um, this this lesson tonight started out as that because and and I'll read when we read the text I'll I'll stop it where I'm going to be dealing with tonight it has to do with what I've already said uh, but now I have to take it in a different direction because of the things that have been happening in the last couple of weeks and I'm going to be I am dead honest with you I wasn't going to talk about UFOs I wasn't However, I had something come across my screen the other day, and I went, oh, they got that from me. I'll tell you guys in a little bit. That'll, that'll be tomorrow, all right? So we got a long way to go and a short time to get there, but let's pray that we get there. Amen. First Corinthians 12, let's read the text. We'll go to the Lord's Prayer. 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts. And by the way, when we're talking about gifts of the Spirit, is there any way that you can earn them? Is there any way that you can pay for them? Are there rituals that you perform that automatically give them to you? No! A million times no! The, the disciples at Pentecost never, ever, ever performed a ritual. They didn't do a dance. They didn't say the right faith-filled words. They didn't, they didn't claim positive things. They didn't, uh, they did not speak negative things or negative thoughts. And that's why God gave them the Spirit. God had already foreordained that He was going to pour out the Spirit in that place to those people. He had it figured out before the foundation of the world, the Bible says. Amen. Before, before, not after, before. And so when you get a gift of the Spirit, it truly is. And it feels like a gift because when God, when God gives it to you, you are at a place probably where you say, God, I didn't deserve this. Why are you doing this for me? Why are you being so good to me, God? It's almost like we get mad at God. Would you knock it off? Would you stop loving me for crying out to it? You know. So anyway, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So having read that, do you believe that as a born-again Christian, that God, for some reason, leaves you out? And if you think that way, you're wrong. God doesn't leave anybody out when it comes to blessing them with gifts. The Bible says it was prophesied that he gave gifts to men. And so here we have them right here. And again, if they're not earned, and there is nothing that you can do to earn them, then it must be a gift. And if you see somebody that it seems to you that they have some sort of spiritual gift, 
and you're a little bit jealous of them, and you might want to say, well, I wonder what, how they get it, or wonder how they did it, uh, how they got a hold of this gift. I'm here to tell you that it was nothing that they did to earn that gift, or else it's not a gift. It's payment for services rendered. But when the Holy Spirit gives them out, it truly is a gift. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Verse 8, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. To another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. It's not a different Spirit. Same Spirit. Word of knowledge. To another faith. Uh, by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing, by the same Spirit. Let me just stop right here and ask you, does God still heal? Sure He does. Absolutely He does. Is, is the book of James right? When it says, is there any sick among you? Let them go before the elders. Anoint their head with all. Is the Bible right about that? Should we still do that? And if God heals somebody, would that not be a gift? It was given at that time through whoever, and I like the fact that he didn't say go to the Pope or go to the priest or go to the bishop. He said go to the elders, go to the men, the elder men of the church, the leaders of the church, not just one of them, but a group of them. That way one person cannot say, well, God healed her through me. And that makes me more special than you, nah, nah, nah. So... To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. Does God still do miracles? Amen. To another, prophecy is proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. Now, not everybody can talk in front of a congregation or group of people. Not everybody is destined to that. Not everybody uh, can do that. But those who can do it, God gave that to them as a gift to be able to deliver the word of God in a clear and discernible fashion. To another, the discerning of spirits. And any one of us can get that gift at the time we're going to need it the most. Amen? Because I, you've heard me say this before. You be in a situation, and I mean there's probably 15 people around you, and... You're for some reason you're figuring out that 14 out of 15 of them is full of devils and you're like Man, I'm in a bad place here. I don't think I belong in this place I don't think I have I don't think I want anything to do with this and that's the Holy Spirit giving you the gift of discernment You may not you may not be able to spot the actual devils that are inside those people but your spirit is communicating with God's spirit and God's spirit is telling your spirit, get that idiot out of there. Get him away from there. Amen. So anybody can have that at any given time. Anybody can have that. Uh, to another discerning spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues. We're going to go in that direction tonight. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all this, so let me ask you this question while we're here right now, while it's on my mind. According to the Bible, if someone, let's say in this congregation tonight, stands and asks permission, they feel like God is giving them a tongue to speak, and I give them permission, and they speak an a tongue, another tongue, one that they had never ever known before, and it comes out of them, and that happens, is it biblically correct? Thank you. It depends. It depends. There's got to be a second witness. At the most, a third witness, and then poof, it's over with, and then, what? One interpret. So if one person stands and does this and sits down, and no one else, then we, have, we, we follow the rule book, don't we? Okay? You should, when you play Monopoly, you should follow the rule book. 
then you'll know what park place is for, or free parking, okay? You'll know what that's for. So anyway, we follow the rule book to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally. That means he severs the gifts and he gives uh, Sister Sandy here something that she needs for today as far as a gift of the spirit. And uh, to others, he may give something else. Some, I do believe people may, can have a lifelong gift of certain things, something that God has given them that they just seem to have a knack for and so on. I believe in that. But I also believe that at various times when a gift is necessary from God and God is going to intervene in a situation, God will step in and intervene and all of a sudden you got a gift. Okay? It was freely given to you from God. And we're, we're going to get into ces cessationism tonight and all kinds of weird things. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for uh, gathering us here again tonight. Lord, we just want to ask you, Father, that you guide us in your word. Lord, we don't know everything. I don't know everything. I don't know near as much as I want to know. And Father, I pray to your God that you would always help me. Just have a desire to want to know. There are things, Lord, that you've shown me in the last few days, God. I just, I cannot get them out of my mind. And I love you for that. I thank you for that. Because, Lord, I want to know. I want to know. Father, I want to know what's coming into my heart, whether or not it's coming from you or not. And, Father, I want to know what's coming out of my mouth, whether it's coming from you or not. So, Father, bless all of us the same way tonight. That whether you are speaking to us or we're speaking your truth to other people, we know the truth and the truth will always make us free. Bless your word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for homecoming 2023. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Isaiah 11, turn there. Isaiah 11. If you have not done this, underline these. These are the nine, no, seven. Excuse me, seven. I almost got that wrong. Seven gifts of the Spirit. Uh, or the seven spirits of God is what I'll say. And I have it written under there, the phrase, Holy Spirit, found seven times. Isn't that something? Seven times in the phrase, Holy Spirit. And if you look at any other translation of the Bible, New American Standard, NIV, New King, they always change it to where you won't find a clear and concise difference between the phrase Holy Ghost and the phrase Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is mentioned exactly seven times in your King James Bible. The phrase Holy Ghost is mentioned exactly 90 times in your King James Bible. How many fruits of the Spirit are there? Nine. Okay, and it's, it's based, 90 is based upon that number nine. It has to do with fruit bearing. So in Isaiah 11, we have a prophecy of Christ. There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That, that, that is Isaiah describing. Like when Jesus came up out of the water after he had been baptized, exactly what the dove did. When he flew into that picture, what did he do? Craig from Shell Knob? He rested on his shoulder. Amen? I, I think God did that for a reason on purpose to fulfill Isaiah 11. The branch shall grow out of his roots and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. That's the first spirit. Spirit of the Lord. Number two, the spirit of wisdom. Number three, understanding. Number four, the spirit of counsel. Number five, might. Number six, the spirit of knowledge. Number seven, and of the fear of the Lord. Those are the seven spirits of God. Now, I have been, I, I will admit, I've overlooked something in the scriptures for, for years now. I've been overlooking it very well, okay? <laughs> I've, I've passed over it so many times that I think I've got a perfect record of passing over it. I've, talk, I've told you that the Bible teaches us that 
we gain, first of all, knowledge, which is learning what the Bible says, reading the Bible, hearing the Bible read or preached. That's knowledge. The spirit of understanding can only come when you have knowledge. You can then compare one thing with another thing, or you can see how they work together, and now you have understanding. It's like when you were taking algebra the, for the first time, and, and you didn't understand what A squared and B had to do with anything with math, but then your teacher explained it in such a way as you went, Oh! I get that. I'm going to get a calculator that does it for me. They got them now. Okay, you can get an app that does that stuff. Anyway, uh, now you understand. And now that you understand, always in life there will be situations presented to you where you'll need to take the things that you have learned and the things that you understand and apply them to what you're going to do, which is wisdom. Some people are wise enough not to get involved in foolish things. Some people are wise enough not to fall for tricks. So hopefully, hopefully all of us now are wise enough that when we get a phone call and the man on the phone clearly has an Indian accent, but he calls himself Chuck, He's not American, is he? That's wisdom, amen? Wisdom says, goodbye, click. Or if you're mean, you can mess with them, all right? But I had skipped over. So we have, we have uh, uh, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I had skipped over counsel. Counsel. What is counsel? Uh, let's say that you have knowledge and you have understanding. You understand that, that God sent His only begotten Son to the earth. You understand that. You understand that Christ died for your sins and that His blood brings atonement for man's sins and so on. And, and um, that means then that you, are, you need to make a choice about what you're going to do with that information that you have learned and that you have understood. Once you are presented with the gospel, you need to make a decision about it. Are you going to accept it or are you going to reject it? Wisdom to accept the gospel that we've learned about, that we understand. It gives us the ability to accept that gospel and be born again. But the spirit of counsel, it was your counselor that talked you into it or gave you the advice to show you, let me get you to understand this your life will turn out if you accept Christ. This is how your life will turn out if you don't. There needs to be a counselor. Everybody in this room and everybody watching online needs a counselor. Somebody say amen. amen. And who is ours? His name is Jesus. Amen. So let me run through these verses very quickly. The counsel of the Lord standeth how long? And you know me. Where does that counsel come from? Hmm. Thank you, thank you. Comes from here. By the way, if you want to come touch my new Bible after church, I'll let you touch it. Okay? The counsel of the Lord standeth forever. That means that, that, means that this book, it wasn't wrong when Isaiah wrote it, and it still isn't wrong now. I mean, the, the only, there's nothing worse, I think, than getting bad counsel from somebody. Remember King Jer uh, Rehoboam, when he was presented the issue of how his father Solomon had taxed everybody basically into poverty, and they went to him, the, the people went to him and said, King, live forever, we love you, you're the king, you're Solomon's son, you're David's grandson, we give you honor and glory, but the taxes that your father imposed on us was over, it was too much. Will you relieve us from the tax burden? And uh, Rehoboam first went to the aged men and they said, cut the taxes. By the way, they, had, they were all Republicans. They said, cut the taxes. Amen. Reaganomics. But then he went to his buddies who had read uh, Marxist literature and 
communist literature and they and he said should I cut their taxes and they said no 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 in fact double them triple them tax the daylights out of them let them know who's boss around here and so what did Rehoboam do he followed after the council the wrong council and he ended up losing the kingdom over it he lost 10 tribes in one day okay so the counsel of the Lord standeth forever, the thoughts of his heart to all generations. Psalm 119, 24, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counsel. There it is right there. In verse form, it's telling you that the counselor of your life will and has been and always shall be your Bible. Proverbs 8, 14, counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am, I am understanding. I have strength. So right here, you've got the spirit of counsel, the spirit of wisdom, and the spirit of understanding, all in the same verse. Proverbs 8, 35, for whoso findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and all they that hate me love death. Your Bible is your counselor. Your counselor will tell you, you need to go down this road and follow this path. You can either choose to do it, or you can choose not to do it. You can forsake the counsel. But if you forsake the counsel, it will be on you for doing it. Not, it won't, you can't blame your counselor. It will be on you for what you did wrong. You did not follow the counsel. And in this case here, the council is important because it, it's going to determine where we spend eternity. Whether in the New Jerusalem with God himself or in the lake of fire. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Amen. That's counseling right there. Psalm, uh, Proverbs 19.20. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. Here we have the spirit of counsel. We have, when it says receive instruction, that's knowledge, that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There's the spirit of wisdom. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. What do you think it means when it says there are many devices in a man's heart? Many, here's just one, one possible scenario. Many ways at which you and I can depart from the living God. Many ways that we can follow that will lead us away from eternal life. So, there are many devices in our heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. Proverbs 20, verse 5, counsel in the heart of a man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Now, as I'm going through this, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you where I'm going with it. I mentioned earlier that uh, my original plan was to do a deal whole weekend on uh, fake Christianity, fake signs and wonders, fake miracles, fake tongues. Okay? And the idea of what is a true biblical tongue. What is the truth of the word of God concerning should we be speaking in tongues? Now, to me, this is really simple. Because if God wanted you to speak in tongues, guess what would happen? You'd speak in tongues. There'd be no way out of it. You'd do it. It's like the year that people were worried about me going to Kenya. I think it was 2014, 2015 maybe. Me, they were worried about it because there was an Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And, uh, oh, Pastor Mike, don't go, man. It's dangerous over there. And I said, well, that, that's up to the Lord if I wake up, you know, the next morning in Kenya, that was of the Lord. If I don't wake up in Kenya, that was of the Lord. And sure enough, that year we got turned away at the airport. And I woke up in my own bed the next morning, not going to Kenya. Who did that? God did. God either did it directly or he allowed it to happen. Either way, it was God's choice. Amen. Uh, let's see here. Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. But a man of understanding 
There's the spirit of understanding. We'll draw it out. Deep water is where the cold water is. Amen? The refreshing water. The water that's settled and clean. So counsel in the heart of man is like deep water. I want to understand deep things from the Word of God. I want to know these things. And so um, what I was saying to you a while ago was one of the theories about speaking in tongues is that it is a language that is given to you by God you speak it even though you know not what you say now here's my primary problem with that and that is everything I'm reading you tonight and you can keep reading if you want to. But everything that I've ever seen in the Bible tells me that when the Spirit of God is upon me, working in my life, I have, at least I have knowledge. Bare minimum, I have knowledge. I have understanding. Now, I mentioned... Uh, it make, nobody had flat tires coming away here. And I went back to that story where we were coming back from camp and I blew a tire out on our RV out here. By the way, if you want to see the tire, it's still out there. I got it sitting on the ground out there. Blew that thing all to pieces. And sure enough, this young man came over to help us. And I knew after, after a few minutes of being with him, I knew that God had brought him to that place at that exact time and me to that exact place at that exact time for us to be together for that. Now, where it goes is up to God, but I know for a fact God had us both there converging in the same place at the same time. Amen? Amen. It says, I may not understand why, but I know what it was. And see, that's what I'm trying to get at. Bottom line is, I have a real serious issue if someone says, well, tongues is a prayer language that I pray to God. And if I ask them, do you know what it is that you're saying? They will tell me no. And my answer to that is, that cannot be from God. As we are finding out. If you want counsel, a man of understanding will draw it out. That means this Bible, 1100. 189 chapters full of counsel from God. And when you are in desperate need of counsel from God, I guarantee you, you'll draw until you draw it out. Amen. And you won't need to go to Joyce Myers to get it. You know, we all have one year for homecoming. We had to cut loose early on a Saturday deal and all of us get in cars and drive over to her office. I can take you right over there and hold up signs, repent. <laughs> Amen. Boy, that'd get us on the news, wouldn't it? Proverbs twenty two twenty. Have not I written to thee excellent things and counsel see he's notice that he wrote them. He wrote them. Have I not written to thee excellent things and counsels and knowledge? He com he connects them both. That I might make thee know the certainty of the words of truth. And this is... Don't let this make you proud. But God has given you enough knowledge and enough counsel so that you know, you doubt what... That the authorized Bible... Amen. And if any other Bible... This Bible, that Bible is automatically wrong. Isn't it that that I make make that means we can ascertain them ascertain from the same root, okay? That thou answer the words of truth to them, send unto thee. So let's say that uh, Jenny, let's say that you've got somebody you just.
met, like at the shopping center or wherever, or some, uh, some new gal you work with or whatever, and she hears that you're a Christian and, and God's been dealing with her, and the Holy Spirit draws her over to you, and God is going to work in you first. He's going to work in her. And so look at that verse again. That thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. She's coming over to you because she heard that you were a Christian. She heard that you were born again. And she knows down deep in her heart that that's what she needs. But she just doesn't know how to get there. And so everything that God has taught you, has filled you in on, has given you, not only in your head, but in your heart, you're going to be able to relay to this person. And hopefully, sure enough, they'll give their life to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how it's done. Amen? That's you planting a seed. Isaiah 9, 6, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful counselor he's your counselor the mighty god the everlasting father the prince of peace job 12 turn there i like this one job 12 Ooh, this is good stuff job 12 11 doth not the ear try words and the mouth taste his meat. Now put those two together. Somebody comes up with some new recipe or something like that, okay? Uh, there's somebody saying I'm cutting in and out. Do y'all see me disappearing? Okay. Phasing in and out, yeah. Somebody comes up with, they went to some new restaurant. Or they got a new dish, and they're going to bring it to you and, and say, here, try this out. So you try it out. You eat it. And your mouth says, don't eat another bite of this. Or your mouth might say, I'm going to eat this whole pan full until I'm sick. Because this is good. And what God is saying here is that the ear connected to the heart does the same thing with words that our tongue does with food. And, and here's something that will just really, I mean, this is going to floor you how wise this is. If you don't taste it, you'll never know. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Amen? If you don't taste it, you won't know it. Taste it. Take a big bite of it. Chew it up. Wash it around with the spit in your mouth. And then feel how that goes down. And you go, oh, that's good. With the ancient is wisdom and the length of day is understanding. How many of y'all know that? Say amen. That's because old people have made a bunch of mistakes in their life. And now they don't make them anymore, those same mistakes. With wisdom, with him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Boy, there's three of them right there. Wisdom, counsel, understanding. Behold, he breaketh down and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters and they dry up. Also, he sendeth them out and they overturn the earth. We've, it has rained here every day this week. And I've been watching the radar. It's like been a line, a diagonal line cutting through Missouri from Kansas City down into the St. Louis area. And the, the, the rain has followed this same line all week long. Every morning I get up the same, same line, same place every day this week. So we've had a bunch of rain. And God is the one who sent that. He either withholds the rain or he, send, or he sends it. Verse 16, with him is strength and wisdom. The, the deceived and the deceiver are his. Look at this. The deceived and the deceiver, they belong to God, don't they? You say, well, I don't know if I believe that. Okay, we'll turn over to um, turn Deuteronomy. I'm probably getting ahead of Deuteronomy 8. Deuteronomy 18. I want to 
show you. Find it. Where is it? A prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And this is, folks, is it cut out? Hmm. Can you hear it now? I'm going to leave that there. People, watch out. We're living in an age of technological signs and wonders, aren't we? Congress is having open door meetings about UFOs. That has never, ever happened in the history of our country. Why? Because these things fascinate us. Those who have seen them, some, some of them are just so, they're so frightened it, it's like they go the rest of their life having nightmares of this. Some of those who see them are made curious and they want to know more about them. But bottom line is, this, these flying vehicles, these chariots, whatever, they're getting man's attention and man is going, I want to know what those are. And we know the government has things that they won't tell us and we want to know what that is. After all, it affects us. And it does, amen? When you know the Bible and you know what these things really are, it will affect them. But can you imagine now living in an age where signs and wonders are going to take place all in the sky, they're going to be in the earth, they're going to be in the sea, they're going to be everywhere. Imagine if you will... Uh, you being in, let's say you got a trip to Europe and you're in Italy somewhere and in the very town that you're visiting, the Virgin Mary decides to appear in front of thousands of people and you're one of those people and you're looking at this image of this, of this woman, you know, robed and got this little head covering on and she's holding her hands like this and you got thousands of people standing next to you crying and going, Santa Maria, Santa Maria. And they're praying to her. And you're looking at this and going, what in the world? If you got any sense, you'll go, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You're not his mother. Amen. That's a familiar spirit. So if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, then giveth thee a sign or a wonder. And the sign or the wonder come to pass. Whoa. It'll happen. Wherever he spake unto thee, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God pr proveth you. Who's really on the Lord's side? Who really is? Did you know that I can stand here and look at each one of you and try to get a, a sense of who's going and who's not? And I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But one of these days, the people who are living a church-based lie, they're going to be known, aren't they? Because God's going to draw a line and He's going to separate sheep from goats. And God says, I sent that prophet. God sent that spirit to look like the Virgin Mary, didn't he? Do you believe that? I can show you from the story of uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat and Micaiah that Micaiah saw exactly that thing. That a spirit, God says, how can I cause Ahab to go up against this army tomorrow and one spirit said this one spirit said that finally one spirit said I can do it and God said wherewith and he said I will go and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all of uh, the prophets and God says go do it and that one spirit was in the mouth of 400 prophets and they all prophesied the same thing and Ahab said see I get we got 400 votes here it says let's go to battle tomorrow 
Who allowed that to happen? God did. Why? Because it was going to fulfill the scripture that said the dogs are going to lick up your blood, Ahab, in the exact same place where you hung Naboth. It's going to happen exactly the way God said. So God is the one who allows these Marian apparitions and these uh, unknown aerial phenomenon that is happening all over the world. God is allowing these things to take place and they're taking place more and more and more and more now. Uh, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And you shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And you shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt. So when these and I've studied and read these Marian apparitions and almost all of them, they're almost identical. This Mary thing will appear. She will introduce herself as Mary. I'm Mary, the mother of God. I'm Mary, the mother of all. The, I'm the mother of the church. I'm the mother of all graces. I'm the mother of this, the mother of that. In other words, I'm really something. And I, I command thee to build me a temple right here in my honor so that people can come and adore me. Listen, that's a harlot. That's a whore. That's a slut. Amen. That's a woman who wants to be seen and everybody to bow down to her. That's what we call that, a diva. That's exactly what that is. That's, the, that's how you can identify a harlot church is that she says, I want you to build some grand temple so you can come and look at me and adore me. And then she says, and I, I want you, you must pray the rosary. Pray it every day. Pray it three times a day. Pray it ten times a day. You must pray the rosary. And so what happens? People fall for that. And what they've done is they've fallen away from the true gospel, which says it's by grace you're saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. Now, uh, let's see here. Back to Job 12. Uh, verse 14, Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. God allows it to happen. He leadeth, and I, I think there was something in me. There had to have been something in me that day. When I went into that Pentecostal church, and I, and I was dead serious, God knew my heart. God, if this is not of you, I don't want it. I don't want to just be seen putting on a show like everybody else is. If this is not of you, keep me away from it. And by His grace, He did. So... The deceiver and the deceived are his. He leadeth counselors away spoiled and maketh the judges fools. Now, if you have no knowledge, no understanding, no counsel, and no wisdom, here's what happens. And remember, let's keep this in the context of those who say that they speak in tongues. But they have no knowledge whatsoever of what they just said. So under, let's now God may be speaking to you, applying it to different things. If that's fine. But this is where I'm going with this tonight. Deuteronomy 32, 28. They are a nation void of what? Counsel. And what do we say counsel was? The word of God. So God's already saying they're, they're a nation void of the King James Bible. They're void of the Word of God. It does not exist in their life. Neither is there any understanding in them. And if, I will tell you that if you do not have this Bible, you do not have any understanding. People, please. People online, please. Don't buy prophecy books that as you flip through the pages and you see that they didn't use the King James, don't buy it. Don't buy it. It's going to mislead you. And or let's say somebody that's on your Facebook friend list. And they pass along some spiritual, some kind of spiritual wisdom for the day. 
If you love Jesus, you'll give this to 10 people. Okay? Um, don't fall for that stuff. Unless what they posted is just verses out of the Bible. King James. Don't fall for people's lies. Don't do it. They're a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise and that they understood this. That they would consider their latter end. You know what was on my brother-in-law's mind and heart? That Sunday morning that he came to me early before church. And he came strolling into my office. You know what was on his mind? The end of his life. He, he, I don't remember if he told me or I'd heard it from my wife or somebody. He may have told me that that Friday morning, he had an appointment with his doctor. And the doctor kind of led on that he was going to fill him in on some things that they found out about his lungs or something like that. I'm probably getting this wrong, but... But he had it in his mind that when he got to the doctor's office that morning, he was going to hear some bad news. And so do you know what he did? He sat and thought about his latter end. And he said, I don't want to go to hell. And God moved him to come to me that morning. And he said, Mike, I want to know for sure that I'm going to heaven. And I told him, I said, I wouldn't say this if it wasn't true. You are. I can tell you are. We read some scriptures. I prayed with him again. And guess what? You know what he heard from the doctor? Nothing, because he died before the, the appointment. Amen. I love that. I don't need no doctors now, thank you. I'm healed, amen. Oh, I love that. I love telling the story about my brother-in-law getting saved, amen. That blesses my heart. Oh, that they would consider their latter end. Job 5, 13, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. Psalm 107, 10, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron. Anytime you see iron, think of the iron kingdom. Because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. You see how they're put together now? The words of God are the counsel of God. And the counsel of God is the word of God. And if anybody says, now I know this is not in the Bible, but let me tell you some things I've learned. Don't listen to them. Okay? Uh, well, it, it, if it's of a religious nature. Now, if somebody's trying to tell you how to change the spark plugs in your car... And they've done it for 30 years. You might want to listen to them. I wouldn't necessarily say, are you King James only? Because if you're not, I don't care what you say. I'm not changing my spark plugs because of you. Yeah, I mean, you I mean, just, you know, can use some sense. Amen. So they contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. And they fell. Look at the wording here. They fell down. And there was none to help. Why? No knowledge. No understanding. No wisdom. And no counsel. Now, Proverbs eleven fourteen, where no counsel is, the people do what? What's going to happen, Will, one of these days? It's going to be a falling away. But in the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Get some people in on your decisions. Some people that you know love God, love the Bible, people that you trust. Let them in on your decisions, okay? Proverbs fifteen twenty two. without counsel, purposes are disappointed. But in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Again, get some counsel. Get some counsel from godly people. Get some counsel from the Lord and see if they match. You're looking for a double witness. I like this. The word wise is mentioned 66 times in the book of Proverbs. 
Y'all write that down. All the forms of the word know, such as know, knoweth, knowledge, 66 times in the book of Proverbs. All the forms of the word understand, understand, understandeth, understanding, 66 times in the book of Proverbs. It's all about the Bible, all about the word of God. Now, Romans 15, 14, here's the New Testament. Now, I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Now, as I'm going through these verses now, I want you to, and it may not be anybody here, maybe somebody watching online, maybe somebody's going to watch this later on, two years from now, three years from now, they're going to stumble across this video, and, they're, and because they were told, that they must speak in tongues in order to show that they are have the Holy Spirit. That they, they must speak in tongues so that they can show that they're really saved. And even though they don't understand a word that's coming out of their mouth, that's a true sign is God right there. I'm here to tell you that is not true. God is a God of knowledge. And those whom he brings into his fold are people of knowledge. We are saved by the knowledge, by the understanding, by the wisdom, by the counsel of God. I am also persuaded of you, my brethren, that you are also full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. First Corinthians 1, that in everything you are enriched by him in all utterance and in all knowledge. That means you know what's coming out of your mouth. Now, brethren, I come unto you speaking with tongues. What shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. He said, if I come to you speaking in tongues, what, what good is that going to do for you? Nothing. You'll get nothing out of that because you don't understand it. Second Corinthians 4, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Knowledge of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 8, Therefore as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance, and notice that he's, that's twice now he's put utterance with knowledge. If you utter something out of your mouth, there better be some knowledge of what it is. And I'm, I'm going to show you why. 2 Corinthians 10, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Ephesians 1, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So here we have wisdom, we have revelation. What does the word revelation mean? To reveal. When you speak in an unknown tongue, it is concealed, not revealed. And what did Jesus say? Anything that's concealed shall be made known, shall be revealed. Philippians 1, 9, And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Knowledge, judgment. Colossians 1, 9, For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. What we have in this verse? Knowledge, wisdom, understanding. Don't we? What is it telling you? That when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are filled with knowledge. You are filled with wisdom. You are filled with even spiritual understanding. That means you understand it in the deep recesses of your, of your being. Your, your very spirit understands it. And I guarantee you what your spirit understands is known. Colossians 3.10, and that put on the new man. Look at this. How is it that God recreated us in knowledge? Because... Oh, Craig, I like you. Craig showed up here one day just kind of out of the blue. Him and Trent, right? Trent Brewington, who grew up with me in this church. And uh, Craig was wanting to be baptized, so I baptized him. And Trent got me aside and he told me, he said, You have no idea who you're baptizing. I said, Who am I baptizing? He said, This guy... Whew, he was a mean rascal. Evil. Evil man. 
And yet I see a change in him. God's changed him. God's turned him around. He's a new man now. And when he was created, God gave him a knowledge in him that surpassed all the mysteries, all the secrets, everything else. God just gave him a knowledge. I'll, I'll never forget when Brady and Bradley Crumb's dad died, Keith Crumb. Or no, the day that he got saved. I, God had me go over to the hospital. He was at the ER. I was in there with him and they were going to put him in. They put him in a hospital room and they had run some tests on him. And uh, we got him to the room. It was about lunchtime. I told Brady and Bradley, I said, you guys split. I want to talk to your dad alone. And so they understood and they left. And I went in and in 10 minutes time, I had Keith praying the sinner's prayer. And it wasn't five minutes after that, we got done. I said, Keith, do you know that you're saved? You're going to heaven? He said, yes, I do. And I said, if you were to die because of what's going on right now, would you go to heaven? He said, I know I'm going to heaven. And I'm telling you, five minutes later, the doctor came in and said, well, it's cancer. And we can't do anything about it. You know, he told his boys the next day. He said, boys, this is, this is strange. This is weird. I don't understand this. He said, I, I just feel like I got somebody living inside of me. Woo! Amen. He understood it one day. He understood it. That's knowledge. Not, not turkey. Maybe I should call that turkey call Christianity. Look up on the screen. Isn't it interesting that you have nine gifts of the Spirit, nine fruits of the Spirit? The gifts of the Spirit are word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith. Faith is a gift, isn't it? Gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, diversity of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. On the other column, you have the nine fruits of the Spirit. Those, this is what is manifested when the gifts of the Spirit are performed correctly. When you really do have biblical wisdom, when you really do have biblical knowledge, when you really do have faith, when you really do have discerning of spirits, the fruit that will come out from you, one of them is love. You'll find that you can love people that you hate right now. Joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, good, that means you're not mean no more. Gentleness, goodness, faith, there's faith again. Wait a minute, faith is a gift of the Spirit. How can it be the fruit of the Spirit? If I plant apple seeds, what am I going to get? More apple seeds, amen, and an apple to go with it. Faith, meekness. Temperance against such there is no law now Tongues turn to first Corinthians 13 Here's what I absolutely am con whoa I knew I should have done that I'm absolutely 100% convinced That this is what's happened Is that gonna fit under there why wow, look you there Why did, in the early church days, why did God have prophets in various cities where there was a church? Why did God call these men prophets? And it was because these are the men that were hearing from God and what they were hearing from God they were transmitting faithfully to the men women and children who were bound to be the believers in Jesus Christ does that make sense to everybody bottom line is in the early days of the church there was one thing that they didn't have yet a written Bible now, they had the Old Testament, but the New Testament was in, it was a work in progress. So let's say the church at Thessalonica. They're having church. 
their pastor, their bishop is preaching out of the Old Testament, but he's also heard, because he went to hear Paul, and he heard Paul say some things, and there was a prophet in that church, and that prophet said, uh, Pastor, Bishop, I got some things to share with you. I believe they're from God. We're going to test these spirits, make sure they're from God. And uh, then if you find that they are, then you can preach them. And then those men would hear from God and they would, that's how it was done. But then, around 150 AD, these same churches started having a Bible. They had the makings of the Bible. And so watch this. 1 Corinthians 13. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Now he's not saying that prophecies shall be worthless. What he's saying is, there's going to come a time when we won't need the prophets to prophesy who are hearing from God and passing on to men what they're hearing from God. We won't need that because we'll have something better. Isn't that what Peter said? We have now a more sure word of prophecy. Why? Because it's written down and all the churches can now know what God has revealed to Peter. Because it's written down now. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. That is called the doctrine of cessation. They have ceased. Why? Because by 150 AD, you already have vernacular translations of the books of the New Testament. You have... Uh, let's see, what was one of the early ones? The Gothic Bible. And uh, the Gothic Bible, there was a, a church where everybody dressed in black and had black fingernails. and That's a joke. But no, it was an area and the language that they spoke was the Gothic language. And there was a man who spent his time translating from the Greek, the four Gospels, the book of Acts, the letter, the epistles written by Paul, James, John, Peter, the book of Revelation, Jude. He was translating them into the Gothic language by 150 A.D. Ulfilus was his name. And um, so as of that point, does there need to be somebody in that church who can speak the word of God in a tongue. Does, does, there, does, does when Paul gets there, and he, let's say Paul's still alive, but it was 150 AD, so he's not. But let's say Paul was still alive and he goes to this church and he's preaching this church. It would need to be that he would either preach through an interpreter or God would give him the spirit of tongue and he would speak to this church in their language. And he wouldn't have to go to language school for the next 10 years. Does that make sense to everybody? That's what it was. That's what happened at Pentecost. They got a tongue to speak and the people who knew that tongue and spoke that language, they, they, they didn't go to where somebody was speaking some other language. They went to the place where a guy was speaking their language. He's going, they're speaking our language. I don't believe this. This is amazing. But there came a time then when those things were translated and written down that the tongue ceased. Didn't need it anymore. So he said, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. So Paul had his part and he writes 14 books of the New Testament. Peter has his part. He writes two books. John has his part. He writes the gospel, the three letters and the book of Revelation. James has a part. Jude has a part. Matthew, Mark, Luke have a part in, in writing the New Testament. Once it's written, they no longer know in part and prophesy in part. Now, you and I can know the whole New Testament. 
Verse 10, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. See how simple that is? It, to me, it's, it's that simple. If I believe that my Bible is perfect in everything it says, do I need somebody to come here and who comes from India? By the way, we're going to have Lords and Rock again back this year. Amen. Uh, and I think uh, we're going to have, he was here last year with his family. Uh, the brother that is uh, doing mission work in Pakistan. I think he's supposed to be here tomorrow. But anyway, uh, if I were to go to India and preach to those people, I would either A, need to go and learn their language and speak it the way they speak it, or God would have to give me the gift of a tongue in order to speak to them. But now we have people who know the Bible who can speak it in both languages. They've learned the languages. They know the languages. That which is in part now is done away because we have that which is perfect. So I don't need, I, I no longer need to know Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek because I have it all translated right here in a book that I absolutely believe is perfect. Now, Here's what false churches turn these gifts into. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, prophecy. These are all turned into occult divination. What is divination? Divination is learning information or gaining knowledge about somebody or something that does not come by way of the five senses. We didn't feel it. We didn't smell it. We didn't taste it. We didn't see it, we didn't hear it, we didn't touch it. So that's what, a, that's what divination is. And this is what a lot, a heavy portion of your Pentecostal slash charismatic slash new apostolic reformation churches have turned these gifts into. They've, they're no longer gifts to these people. These people think they have to do things to earn them. They're told that they must increase and rise to higher levels before they can ever have any of this gifts. I'm here to tell you that God says no way to that kind of nonsense. God says, I'm going to take the foolish of this world and make him confound the wise. But they've turned it into occult divination. Uh, somebody, some of these clowns on TBN or whatever, they're going to... Pat Robertson. Pat Robertson used to end his show every day with he's closing his eyes now and for some reason when a man of God is going to prophesy and give a word of knowledge he must close his eyes as tight as humanly possible I mean you can't just go like this you have to go oh right now I'm getting a word of knowledge and if you go back and watch Pat Robertson, it's so blatantly fake and phony and generic. Right now, there's a woman in Tulsa, Oklahoma, having back pain. God's going to heal that pain. How many women in Tulsa have back pain? <sighs> and people fall for that stuff. They fall for it. They want signs and wonders. Discerning of spirits, gifts of healing, working of miracles, diversity of tongues, interpretation of tongues. These are lying signs and wonders. They're meant to make people think that the people who can speak in tongues or the people who can interpret tongues, which is almost never done, that those people have, are superior to everybody else in the church because other people, and I've had people testify to me of this, they would be in a charismatic or Pentecostal church for years and never, ever, ever have the ability to pop off with tongues or... You all right there, cheeseburger? Are you all right? Okay, cool. Okay. Hope you find what you're looking for. Um, but anyway, they, they, they long to have 
what these other people are making them think that they have. And when they go to their uh, people in their church, like their pastor or whatever, and say, how come I've not had this? They say, well, you're not, you're not strong enough to have this. You, you don't have enough faith to have this. Or you're not, you're not on the same level as those who do have it. You need to kind of climb that ladder a little bit before you can have that. Listen, let me tell you something. There's two kinds of people in this world. Lost people and saved people. And on the ground that the saved people are on, it's all level ground. Amen? Not one of us, not one of us is any better than the other. And then faith, they've turned that into witchcraft. Did you know Kenneth Copeland? Kenneth Copeland says that God spoke the words of creation, but he had to, um, he had to believe his own words and apply the power of faith in his words before his words could create the universe. That's blasphemy. That's, that's a heretic. And I hope everybody in America and, well, half of America and all of Kenya heard me say this right now. By the way, we're going to try to simulcast the pastors in Turkana on this screen tomorrow morning. We're going to try it. Okay, so y'all pray that technology works because these men are excited about this. Okay, and I think it would be neat for them to be with us tomorrow morning. What, don't you? Of course, it'll be tomorrow afternoon for them, but anyway. Now, Deuteronomy 18.10, There shall not be found among you anyone that, number one, maketh his son or his daughter. Notice there are nine forbidden practices. These are the antithesis to the fruits of the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit. It maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. By the way, this picture is the Bethel Church at Redding, California, where they have what's called a fire tunnel, and they cause people to pass through the fire. That's, that's Satanism. They're worshiping the devil in that church. Use a divination, an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Now, the term glossolalia is the theological term. It's more than theology, but it's the term used to describe people. There, in fact, there's two, two forms of it. Glossolalia means that you can speak and a tongue that no one on earth knows. That's glossolalia. Then there is xenolalia. Xenolalia is more in line with the scripture. Xenolalia says that you have the ability to speak a language that is already known by people in this world and that when you speak it to them, they understand every word you say. Now, is that what happened at Pentecost? Sure it was. But what you hear in the churches now is glossolalia. They are either speaking or pretending to speak a language that no one knows. And nine times out of ten, it's rehearsed and practiced and fake. Now, I got a video to show you. Uh, I came across this. This is what gave me the idea for it. Apostle movement. But it also has roots in paganism, shamanism, and was even picked up by New Age spiritualists like Terence McKenna. When you take psilocybin, you can fall spontaneously into states of glossolalia. Sometimes on DMT, it's almost impossible to control. It just spontaneously comes out. It's language-like activity in the absence of meaning. Men ah! Fill him up. Let him overflow. Glory, 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 glory. And I felt when he comes, all your hair stands up. Mandelile boshi ki karama do de barama no sabosha. Isadani ande di na morbina. A boshi to the karibisa boshi futele mosuma shama handle na masomo to kont kot karikis. Korakisa korakisa karmes manso kashinan. Isomote ne la mahon bi ala kasu. Ina masakri isadaria. Aun esama no hosh bi. Misune penat insontoris mukurush maria. Mande kishiti kolora ba shata. 
manda kalaboho masiki loboko da masa kadita na namosoya la ma kamba sotoya in the name of jesus your head shin your head shin right now your head shin your head shin by the blood of jesus hena baka rakata hasa mandara baka tara rakata kaseka rakata baka ta come on and pray in the spirit sekata baka rakata baka shakata mando oko soko ta rakata baka ta rakata baka saka shala baka sa in the name of jesus you be made whole by the power of god kamo sharesi kama ma bahotori hese ya nada ma hasa zi ding kwa makti ki pitech kwen wa de molde ruf no baka kenget f Fops titulchk hem bedigen hegeng tetchk kakabasan da just getting into a prophetic vein mama moko solo lo basata manda de king di din de bo someone with a digestive tract problems quickly call manda da bakasata there's a miracle for you manda kishin di do so your intestinal problems someone with similar intestinal problems we've seen several people being delivered from the classmate bag so lo basoya disability with a child some type of a learning disability we've seen many many children healed we've seen midgets grow we've seen arms and legs that stop growing because the growth cells that stop manda da basata i don't make this stuff up you don't open your mouth the holy spirit can't talk all right now i want everyone to raise your hands and we're going to pray in tongues so go ho rashada ka hala bo no no rashada ka hala bo doesn't matter what they think <laughs> oh do borodia sta pagalia do oh le bevedia basho do pre in a man man no boko no bon jamba la la ma pangala ma head am h day scab she pull bomb in my pe prama to do bo bo fia ma ela ma vai ke ki me penste tam prama begrede
that these people would call you dead because you don't do that. They would say, you're dead. You're not alive in Christ. You don't have the Spirit. They, it's a... It's, it's one of two things. It is either totally fake and phony. And when it comes to these... Um, the guys up on the stage, like Copeland and, and Kenneth Hagin and John Kilpatrick, who you just saw there, and other ones, I firmly believe that they have rehearsed these words, these phrases. They've learned to put certain syllables together. There is, if you listen to them long enough, there is a, there's a repetition in how many of the words end. A lot. And I'm not sure exactly what it means, but a lot of these guys that do this, almost all the words end in something like Tanda, Shanda, Panda, Tanda, Upanda. It's, it's always like that. It's, and to me, that is a sure sign. That's made up. You're, you're making up on the fly things that are easy to roll out of your mouth instead of complicated words, which, let's be honest, a lot of our language is complicated. And especially someone learning to speak English, those, our words are complicated to them, just like us trying to... Is that with some of the people, especially that when I saw those children there, that gave me cringes, is that they have been taught to believe that that is the way to God, that they have supernatural powers now. And they can speak in these languages. And yes, I believe it is absolutely possible, if not probable, in many of them. That they are speaking under the control of a familiar spirit. Now, what did you say to me a while ago about UFOs? You just made a connection. Tomorrow morning, that's where we're going to go. Okay? I've got several examples that's going to connect what you just saw, what we just seen from the scriptures, connect it together with the whole UFO thing, which will then, it should nail it for you, that the UFO movement that we see going on right now is not just, uh, again, Congress did not have meetings last week with testimony on pilots who saw Santa Claus. They had meetings last week with pilots who engaged UFOs, engaged them in the air and said they could do things that we cannot do. So there is a spirit in this movement. And last year when we went to MUFON, we were right across from a lady who is very prominent in the UFO uh, movement and had I had God given me the things to say, I would, have, I would have talked to her. It wasn't until after we left that I'm going, I know I can think of all kinds of questions I should have brought up and asked her. But uh, we're going to go rub shoulders with these people again. And these people are under the, the belief that for the most part, these UFOs and their creatures that inhabit them are here for the betterment of our planet. That's a setup. Okay? It's a lie. And so, uh, tomorrow morning we're going to finish uh, this part. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going to uh, talk about the congressional hearing that took place last week. Um, where one of the guys testifying said something that was almost to the letter what God showed me from the Bible about these UFOs. I couldn't believe it when I heard it. It's in the congressional record now. I'll be showing you that clip tomorrow. Uh, we're also going to um, deal with this issue of, of the children who are being trafficked all over the world and why their blood is so important. Okay, all of this stuff, people, this is the this is the world we're living in right now. And God's people, I think, need to be informed 
on what's really going on, and the Bible's going to lead us there. It's going to show us everything that's happening. Aren't you glad you believe the Bible? Say amen. amen. All right. And also, tomorrow afternoon, uh, we, are gar we are going to try to do a question and answer. And so, uh, if you have any questions you'd like to ask me, write them down on a slip of paper. Uh, give them to me or give them to my wife um, or somebody that you know goes search here. Give them to John, Michael, Alicia or whatever. Give them to somebody who can get them to me and uh, we'll see if we can have a question. We're going to try to include some of the pastors uh, in on that as well. So we're looking forward to a good day tomorrow. Are you glad you came? Say amen. amen. I'm glad you came. Let's stand to our feet. Uh, yeah, well, that was going to, had, had I, had I gone that direction, I already had a place in my notes for Peter Popoff. I already had a place in there. He was all set up and ready to go. Okay. Uh, by the way, since I won't be doing this tomorrow, um, we had a case here in Missouri. Uh, a young man went missing. He was 11 years old. Um, and I'm trying to remember his name while I'm talking. But anyway, he went missing. And uh, at some point, you know, the, they pretty much figured that he was dead somewhere. There was all kinds of stories that, that went around. Uh, we did not know, Sean Hornbeck was his name. We did not know the family. We did not know Sean. I didn't know him. I didn't know his family. But I pastored down there in Richwood for three years, and that is a town where everybody knows everybody. And I, everybody that I knew from Richwoods knew Sean and knew his family. And uh, so when all of a sudden now he surfaces because the police follow a tip that leads them to an apartment building up in Florissant, Missouri, which is northwest St. Louis County, uh, they found the young man that they were looking for, and they found Sean Hornbeck. His parents went to a psychic, James Van Pra. He is uh, one of the big names in psychics, and he has a TV show or had a TV show. And I found the video of his show. And Chris, I wrote down everything that James Van Pra predicted or tried to pull in from the, you know, the spirit world on how they could find Sean Hornbeck. He was wrong on every single occasion except for one thing when he said, I believe he's still alive. And we now know that he was. But I wrote down, I've got it in my notes, I wrote down everything that he predicted for this grieving mother who's lost her son, wants to know where he is. And this guy lied through his teeth about everything. And you know what? He went and did another show after that, and he had a whole season of it. He's still out there, as far as I know. One of the best psychics that there is. And got it wrong every single time. And I'm glad I have a Bible. Amen?